Here we go. Hello, science enthusiasts. My name is Jason Zakowski. I'm the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs, on social media. Every week in SciChat, we bring you amazing experts to enthrall you with their area of knowledge. Today, we have two. And I want to thank both of you for being guests tonight because it was relatively short notice. We have DNA criminalist Leela Periello and detective slash investigator Lisa <laughs> King. So without further ado, welcome. We're doing two guests at once. How are you both doing tonight? Good. How are you? Good, good. Now, I'm good as well. Perfect. So wh- wh- I think what we'll do since there's two guests, I- and I don't like to, when I'm doing um, sort of a panel, call on people too much, is I'll, I'll pose a question and feel free to jump in. Say your name, though, just so people know who's talking. Say, this is Lisa or this is Leela. Am I saying your right name right? I'm screwing it up, aren't I? <laughs> it's Leela. Leela, okay. You're good. Yeah, um, Leela, um, just say your name and then, you know, you can you can go after that. So the first question is, tell us a little bit about what you do for a living. Like, what do you do for your job in... Uh, and, you know, as an investigator or a crim- DNA criminalist? Um, well, I work in a crime lab with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. Okay. And I specifically work in the forensic biology uh, unit. So there I'm a criminalist. So I'll take the, the evidence that's collected on scene and determine if there's a biological fluid in there that I can extract the DNA from and then try to get a profile to see who that might be. Okay. Okay. And I am a uh, criminal investigator or a detective with the Ottawa police service. And my area of expertise is sexual assault and child abuse. I am currently uh, in our training section, uh, training the up and coming detectives with uh, different things. Okay. So, since this is science chat, we'll have a little bit heavier uh, slant on the DNA, but I, I know we, we kind of talked behind the scenes, Lisa, that uh, you like you do rely heavily on DNA for stuff that you do as a detective. Absolutely. So I, I appreciate the science of it. So I think that would be a great place to start. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Leela, what does it take? Like, what's your what's your education to work as the, at the job you have? And then over to you, Lisa, after that, like what's, what does it take to be, um, to work in a lab as a DNA criminalist? What does it take to be a detective? Okay. Um, well, as a, a criminalist, we mm-hmm. need a, a degree in a science-based field. So chemistry, biology, um, mine is a, uh, I have a, a, an undergrad of BS in psychology, but I was also pre-med. So I had all the science classes there. Hmm. And then I have a master's in forensic science. So I was able to focus a little more on the forensic aspect, but for specifically for the DNA uh, unit, the FBI requires certain classes and that includes uh, genetics, molecular biology, statistics, uh, biochem, and yeah, upper level classes like those. So. And I have absolutely no science with my background. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I am the... Uh, actually, I'm a police officer, so uh, my background is uh, actually uh, elementary education from the University of Al- Alberta, and uh, I um, taught for a very short period of time and then uh, joined the Edmonton Police as a crisis worker. So my background is just uh, various police training investigative courses and uh, just experience on top of that. Hmm. Leela, when you were young, were you interested in science? Like you, like taking all of these and, you know, taking a bachelor's uh, and then uh, psychology and pre-med, were you, as a young person, were you interested in science? Yes. Yes, I was. Um, when I was little, my mom actually introduced me to uh, Silence of the Lambs. Oh my so. good! How young were you? What? <laughs> I was in like 
maybe junior high. Oh maybe. my goodness. Okay, then. <laughs> so I wanted to do forensic psychology because I thought that was really cool. I liked her job. Oh, um, uh, Clarice, Clarice Starling, right? Yes. Is, yes. Okay. Um, but then I decided to go to more forensic pathology. And so hence the pre-med bit. But after working in a pathology department for a few years, I realized that I wanted to be more out in the field. <clears throat> so I went to um, actual death investigation for about mm. 12 years. And then I moved over into the crime lab for DNA. We had talked so, about that yeah. on the podcast. Now I'm remembering you worked in uh, as a death investigator for many years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yep. Hmm. So yeah, always been interested in science. Decent. Um, and, and Lisa, were you, were you the kid that was, uh, bringing law and order to all of the other children on the playground? <laughs> Actually, when I was young, I wanted to be a teacher. I did oh, not okay. want to be uh, a police officer. And it wasn't until I was uh, working with the police that I thought, you know, I, I want to go behind the scenes and actually solve some of these, uh, oh. some of these investigations that are going on. So that was my introduction to it. Gotcha. But I also used uh, Silence of the Lamb. I use it when I teach, actually. <gasps> often, often. You do? Yes. How? how, how you got to tell me. How do you use... I like. I love that movie too, but like when I watched it, I I wasn't like I need to like get myself into law enforcement or become a criminalist. <laughs> so <laughs> it's um it, the the one scene where she actually knocks on Buffalo Bill's door, and it's just it's an introduction to Ooh. our recruits about the importance about paying attention uh, with what's around you and observing mm -hmm. and taking really, really good notes because what might seem very insignificant at the time can become very, very significant later on. Oh, excellent. I like that. There you go. No, no, why if... We work well together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think, was there like foreshadowing and like in that scene, obviously there was stuff laying about that she missed. Is that what happened? Yeah. Okay. They're uh, the moth flying around and just the sewing, mm. uh, the thread and the patterns. And uh, of course, the gun on the stove was a giveaway as well. But. Yeah. Isn't that the thing? Like, I do enjoy watching those true, cry, two true crime things on Netflix. And sometimes it's like some obscure police person's note is the thing that sinks the bad person. Exactly. That's yes. so important, the note taking. <laughs> so. Oh, Yeah. If they had told us like how much paperwork there was, oof, <laughs> I don't know if I would have done this. <laughs> so you do need people like Hitchcock and Scully. Like you do need paperwork police people. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. a Brooklyn nine, nine reference reference. I don't know if you've seen that TV show. <laughs> yeah. I, I use that too, actually. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. Just for the lighter moments in it. <laughs> oh, so my question as we get to it, if, if you're just joining us for side chat, it's a little bit different tonight. We have two guests. Um, one works, uh, Leela works with DNA and, and then we have Lisa who's a detective. So they, you, 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 Leela, you're in the United States and, and Lisa, you're in Canada, but you're probably your departments team up together. Would they not like you, Delila, do you need detective people to, to help you out with some of the work that you do and then vice versa? I don't know. Oh, yeah, we definitely need to work together as a team mm. um, because they're the they're the frontline people out there that are, you know, interacting with the victims and mm. collecting the, you know, the, the information that our crime scene people need for how to examine stuff hmm. or the detectives are the ones that are out there getting the search warrants to get the, the buckle swabs from the suspects that I'm going to use to compare to the crime scene sample. Huh. So yeah, we definitely have to work together. Absolutely. So very similar. We um, we gather the evidence here. Um, mm -hmm. We've uh, we'll deal with the people involved. We have our forensic identification people who uh, gather all our evidence for us, and then we determine what is the best evidence. And uh, we are not as fortunate as in the states where we have uh, forensic labs as part of our forces. We use the, uh, the Center of Forensic Sciences in Toronto, here in Ontario. Oh, uh, so everything goes there for analysis. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. So I might derail. Like I sent you both questions, and now I'm thinking I've got I've got a list of ones that are pertinent to talk about right now. So <laughs> if you don't mind, indulge me with just a, a team up question. The first one is just a little bit more 
um, pop culture. So I mentioned, I like watching like crime, true crime documentaries on Netflix being as you both work in and around and with law enforcement slash crime, do, do you get burnt out if you watch those? Like, is that like somebody like me who's a teacher coming home and watching a teaching show? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Um, I don't, I'm just curious. Um, do you want to go ahead, Lisa? Um, it's, it depends what it is, which show it is. Cause okay. some I find very, very interesting and some, um, well, some are more, not the true crime so much, but like the crime shows, I just, I roll my eyes a lot. Oh, yeah, like CSI, yes. like the CSI shows. Oh, the CSI, <laughs> yeah. Where they took print off a feather. I just, you know, I, I, oh. I still roll my eyes thinking yeah. about that and. And walking in slow motion with my hair blowing in the breeze all the time, even oh. when I'm inside. So it's uh, stuff like that. But yeah. some I find very, very interesting. Like it's uh, just that you try, especially as they pertain to um, stuff that's happened in Canada in mm. the past and, and the UK and, of course, the States. But Canada, of course, is, uh, is uh, my home country. So I like those. So you both don't roll up to a crime scene in like high heels and uh, designer clothes, like what I've seen on yeah. TV. You're saying and that doesn't really we don't happen. have a Hummer either. Oh, no, we don't <laughs> no. have the cool stuff. I might be in a suit because I work in a suit because I'm not actually get like I'll uh, look at the crime scene because I need to know what my crime mm. scene is. So I'll do my crime scene once it's been processed. I never go into the crime scene until it's been processed. And Leela will be phenomenal about talking to you about transfer and everything with DNA. Oh, yes. and <laughs> not. So it's uh, mm-hmm. so once my crime scene's processed, then I will go in and I'll do a 360 and uh, figure out uh, where I need to go and, and just so mm-hmm. I've got the crime scene in my head itself. Hmm. Yeah. One of the uh, one of the better shows that I think is the uh, Law and Order UK. Mm-hmm. And oh, I've never heard for, of this. It's good, um, especially for the crime scene portion of it and the analysis of stuff is is very accurate. Wow, it's one of the better ones I think. Yeah, the UK is awesome for their police shows. Mm-hmm. Okay, and is it like a is it a fake show or is it like based on police? Like, is it like the American ones where it's a like a a dramatization it's a dramatization like the american ones but they're the way that they portray the science portion of it is more realistic oh than i love shows. that that's so cool so you'll actually see their crime scene people out in the full like plastic bunny suit doing things that they need to do properly and instead of like <laughs> Picking stuff like up the, with pens. <laughs> yes. And their hair all over the place. And yeah. yes, no mask and stuff. Yeah. So. Going into crime scenes four or five times. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to you both for uh, like for hours. It's just about like pick an episode of one of these shows and we'll just destroy it for all of the inconsistencies. <laughs> that, that would That'd be fun. Be That'd be fun. I've done this with astrophysicists be. before um, with um have you seen Sandra Bullock's Gravity? The the movie with Sandra Bullock called Gravity. Yes. Yeah. yeah I great. Haven't seen that one, but I know about it. Yeah. So but. it's a, a. I thought it was like I thought it was a very gripping movie, but the astrophysicists have such a problem with it because like ev- <laughs> everything is just so so crazy wrong. So they're like, yeah, you know, it's you know, it's got good drama, but like mm. everything is completely bananas. Um, <laughs> like I like Sandra Bullock. Oh, I love Sandra Bullock too. <laughs> <laughs> I rewatched with my wife uh, a couple weekends ago the proposal. Have you seen that Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds? Oh, um, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. 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 It's great. Great. Okay. He's about to buy our senators, by the way. Yes. Yes. I heard <laughs> that Ryan Reynolds is going to buy the Ottawa senators. So, yeah. but I digress. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, anyways, let's get back to DNA. Um, <laughs> Lila, you you as a DNA criminalist, you analyze DNA. Now, for people that only understand that, and that includes me with a basic amount of biology, I don't teach, I'm not a biologist, I'm a chemist. How and how does DNA get gathered? That would be my first question. Where does DNA come from that you would then use in your lab? Okay. Uh, DNA can actually come from any biological source. Mm. So it could be saliva, sweat, um, touch, which would technically be sweat, um, blood, semen, 
uh, vaginal secretions, um, tissue from from a person, um, pretty much anything that came off or out of a person would be a, a good source. Teeth, uh, bone, those are good. Hair. So if I'm walk, if I touch a wall, could you get DNA from that? Like if I touch a wall and. Is it, it it depends on a lot of things. Okay. All right. Um, so it's more complicated than my question is. Hey. Yeah. The, the touch is the most complicated one because it depends on how much, um, how big of a transfer you are or a shedder as we call them. Okay. Um, people that shed a lot of cells. Like if you have sweaty, sweaty hands and you touch that wall, you're going to leave a lot more DNA than somebody that has dry hands. Oh, so it depends on on those type of situations or how long you touch it. Did you just brush against it? Did you like lean on it? Things like that. So it's that's a little more complicated for the touch. But um, I deal mostly with sexual assault victims and their kits. Mm. Um, so those would be swabs of their their body and things like that. So those would be more DNA generally than a touch. Mm, I gotcha. Okay. Mm. So we would swab those, um, other things like hair, you would just collect the hair and then I would look for uh, the root of the hair. That's where all of the, the DNA lives. Um, you can get mitochondrial DNA out of the hair itself, but that's not what I, what we analyze in our lab. So. Okay. So if I, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Can I just expand on that? Just yeah, no, go ahead. Go. I'm just, I'm just happy to listen. When we uh, go to a crime scene, if and my expertise is sexual assault as well, so if there's, uh, we'll immediately take the victim to a hospital, and mm-hmm. if there, uh, we have consent to get uh, the kit done, we'll do that. But one of the things we'll also gather is we'll gather clothing, we'll gather yes, yes. Uh, things that are around the scene. If it uh, if the sex assault took place in a bed, we'd gather the bedding mm-hmm. and whatnot, and then we would talk with our. Uh, forensic ident people, and we would determine the best source of DNA, uh, possible DNA to be uh, located to send to our labs. Mm -hmm. And if we make an arrest at scene, we'll put our uh, suspect into what we call a dry cell, so they cannot wash themselves. Oh, wow. And uh, do swabs that way, too, of their hands and genitalia, etc. Yep, exactly. Then I'll get those samples from, say, HERC, and say it's a bed sheet then I can examine that bed sheet uh, in the lab using um, either just visual like room light or I can use fluorescent light uh, to help me uh, track down any semen because it fluoresces under UV light. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that would help me to determine what areas to collect samples from. And so my follow-up question is if you have say a good sample how accurate is DNA, um, like the, the the when you run a DNA test, like to explain that to somebody who has heard, oh, you're a match. How accurate is matching? <laughs> uh, it can be extremely uh, accurate. We don't technically say a match. Okay, so uh, that's that's a bad that's bad language from CSI. <laughs> it's just because it's not. We're not. We're only analyzing twenty four. Um, locations in our, our genome. Um, we don't analyze the entire genome, so we can't statistically say it's a match. Mm. Um, we can just say that things are a, <clears throat> uh, you know, they have, it offers limited or moderate or strong support for like up for a proposition. So our proposition would be that suspect is one of the contributors of the DNA obtained from this, um, the DNA results are, you know, 57 septillion times more likely if suspect um, was rather than an unknown, unrelated person. Oh, <laughs> septillion. That seems like that's yeah. a pretty good. It's huge. It's a huge. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah. So it's more than the, the, the population of the Earth. Yes. Yeah, many, many, many times more. Yes. So when I have a match and we've done the, um, as Leela mentioned, when I've written that lovely warrant for a DNA sample and, and we collect blood when we do that, um, it's when I'm testifying in court and they've done the analysis because they'll have a profile that they've uh, done and then we'll match it possibly with the DNA and 
the what I'll testify to is that in one one of my trials, I testified that uh, this chances of it being uh, the accused uh, was fourteen quadrillion to one. <laughs> oh my goodness! So yeah. it's it's pretty accurate. Yeah. Oof. So you can't say there's. I guess you you can't say there's no you know there's a chance it's somebody else, but the chance is so infinitesimally small, as if to yeah. be almost an impossible. The only time you come up with an issue is is in the like with twins, because oh. those would like identical twins. They would have the same sections of DNA that I look at. Yeah. So what what about family, family members? Like, is there much of a difference between say uh, son, dad, sister, brother? Or well, son, the difference between like son and dad would be he would the son would get half, half of his DNA. So it'd be a fifty percent of the of the mm-hmm. match or fifty yeah. percent of the. Oh, okay, all right. I was and just we, yeah. We have specific people in the lab that know how to do the statistics for um, genealogy and parental and siblings. Hmm. So yeah. <laughs> so the other question I have is is as you both work with assault. Is DNA used like uh, for what would be something else that a DNA criminalist would use DNA for outside of that that maybe the average person wouldn't think about? Like to solve um, for crimes or, 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 or anything else? You mean like what other types of crimes we could use DNA for? Well, or even, yeah, like what other types of crimes? Yeah, be, beyond assault. Um, we actually uh, use DNA for for uh, vehicle theft. Uh, say someone really? stole a vehicle. Mm-hmm. How? how? We, can, we can swab the, the actual, the, like the steering wheel, the gear shift, oh. or the door handle inside the car. And then we'll get the, the DNA from the usual driver. And we can subtract the usual driver from any profile we get off the steering wheel. Mm. And then that might give us who the last drive, who the last person was, maybe the suspect. So huh. we can also get it. Say they crash the car. These are really good is if they, if they crash the car <laughs> and the airbag goes off, sorry, <laughs> they'll, they'll the have DNA everywhere. <laughs> yes. The DNA will be all over the, the airbag and it'll be usually single source for that person. Well, yes. Cause obviously the previous driver is not driving around with yeah. an exploded airbag. <laughs> an airbag in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little dangerous and inconvenient, just like a yes. Fig Newton sticker over the front of your windshield. Oh, you <laughs> Another, got that one? Talladega Nights reference? <laughs> a little bit, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Another offense would be break and enters if they've mm-hmm. uh, mm. cut themselves where they've left tools uh, mm-hmm. on scene or they've touched uh, particular areas or um, used the bathroom or a lot of uh, criminals aren't very smart. No. They no. will eat food and they will yeah. drink and they will do a bunch of things and leave it on the scene. We so have one person. These are like people that break into a house and they make a sandwich, right? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's no. common. I thought that was just like, no, it's yeah, not. They do that. Yeah. They, yes. They just, they'll, I will always be gainfully employed. Thankfully. Yes. For them. Oh so, yeah, we will. <laughs> we had one where they actually like clean their ears out with a Q-tip and what? left it in the trash. Yeah. No. It was special. So. Yeah. You got to love those. You got to love yeah. those. Or the ones that are robbing stores and they leave stuff behind. Yeah, that's good yeah. too. What, yeah, did, what are they leaving rent. behind? What What are you bringing with you in the first place to rob a store and then leaving behind? Like, like a shoe? Like, glove, like gloves or... What? Yeah. Yeah, I had hats left where they yes. take off their hats. Those are good. And, or they're running out and their hat comes off. Uh, so in the in the time of COVID, we've had face masks. Um, oh, those that's are good. excellent. Um, I was going to say was, they're breathing into that all day. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, it's amazing, and yeah, it, it's uh, we're constantly. And one of the things that we teach investigators and and our officers on the road is just to, to manage when they're managing the crime scenes, or they find a stolen car. You know, please don't go out and or, like start touching everything. Like it's just. Mm-hmm. Uh, you certainly have your, your gloves on and not your search gloves because there's DNA from or transfer from everything you've touched during your shift. Right. So that's, uh, but to, to put on your latex gloves and, and be very careful or just seal the car and have it towed hmm. and analyzed later. Uh, Liz from chat has a question for the two of you. 
Uh, it's up in the nest. I've got a question. To ID someone using DNA, don't they have to be in the system for comparison? Say, decide, let's say Liz is all done working on her PhD <laughs> and she needs to get a little moolah. She decides to go to the criminal route. <laughs> yeah, she decides to go full on supervillain, some kind of super psychologist supervillain. Um, she does a break and enter and someone uh, dies. Would they be able to, ooh, that got dark quickly. Would they be able to tell it's me since I'm unknown to law enforcement? Okay, so like, th- do you get the gist of the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to answer? Okay, <laughs> sure. Or do, yeah, it's, um, well, there's always other sources to investigation. You don't have to be mm-hmm. in our data bank. And actually, to be in our data bank, you have to be convicted of a criminal offense. It has to be a violent offense. You're here in Canada, anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to be uh, convicted of break and enter is considered one that you can, robbery or a violent offense, assaults, homicide, sex assaults. And then your DNA will ask for a DNA order in order for your, your DNA to be put in your data bank. But this is why we have amazing people like Leela. When we don't have that DNA sample in our data bank, you're going to be you're going to put on your detective skills and you're going to do your investigation and you're probably going to get uh, Leela is going to come up with a profile for Mm -hmm. us. Hmm. And we're going to take that profile with our investigation and hopefully come up with some suspects or do some elimination samples, as Leela had mentioned, and uh, get them uh, that way. Because a lot of sex assaults, uh, we don't have a profile in our data bank. Yeah. And it's, um, but it's amazing how many sex assaults we solve with people who've been convicted of break and enters. So it's. Uh, it's amazing. So, the offender database when they yeah, like if you're in the states, they if you're arrested or if you're convicted, um, put in jail, um, will will take uh, people's DNA a lot more frequently, I think, than Canada does. So yeah, we, we have to up in order to take it. Yeah. So, okay, so I have a so I have a question. Is, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leela. That's okay. Um, Liz is completely uh, out in the clear unless she uh, gets caught. Uh, doing a breaking and entering so yeah yeah. or unless i'm investigating it liz so be careful liz says she promises not to turn to a life of crime (laughs) okay good (laughs) (laughs) so i have a question and this is this is from me watching hollywood cop shows and maybe this lisa you could answer this one so leela gives you a profile and you've got some suspects can you trick a suspect to get their DNA, like bring them a Tim Hortons and have them then get it from the garbage? Like I've seen that in so many cop shows. They like kind of steal the DNA from the person this somehow. This is an awesome, awesome question. Uh-huh. So there's there's two ways we – well, there's a few ways we can we can obtain their DNA. So we can't use trickery. Like I can't invite you – uh, to my office and say, hey, Jason, I want to interview on this. And hey, would you like a cup of coffee or would you like some water? <laughs> and thirsty. leave the cup and then have you drink for it because I've got the intent that I'm going to use that for DNA. Mm-hmm. But let's say I'm uh, having you surveilled. Uh, we've got mm-hmm. surveillance on you and you are walking down the street and you do have a cup of tins, tins and you drop that cup on the sidewalk or you drop it in the garbage and we've got um, really keen surveillance officers who are able to identify which cup was yours, or we do this with cigarette butts and everything mm-hmm. all the time. Oh my goodness. And they'll get cast off DNA. That's called cast off DNA. What? And then, of course, once we get, then we'll send that to Leela, who'll mm-hmm. give us this fabulous profile. And then I will write a beautiful warrant and I will have you come in and I will have you yeah. take, give me your DNA. And then I will send it to Leela. She'll compare it and yeah. she'll go, we've got him. So, yeah. Because we can do the, like, it's exactly like she said, it's so cool. Or if they're at a restaurant and you get their, their dishes, like their fork, mm-hmm. that's cool too. Oh man, um, they're, they're yeah. royally forked with you guys on the, on the, exactly. on their trail. <laughs> it's considered abandoned. Like when something's yes. abandoned, we can take it, but we have to, like, I can't just bring you into the office and say, here, drink this and then <laughs> take this cup very carefully, put it in an evidence bag and run it down the hall. What if they come into the cop shop? With their own Timmies, and then they leave it there? Or is that a gray area? That is a gray area here in <laughs> Canada. <We laughs> I'm just trying to think really, of all these loopholes. <laughs> yeah, there, there is, um, we could write to it. I would, I would probably need to write a warrant okay. for it. 
but um, warrants are amazing things. So it's uh, they give us a lot of power mm-hmm. if they're granted, and we can defend them in court. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, there's different ways. We've got a lot of case law that protects that because we mm-hmm. have uh, our charter is very strong, and we mm-hmm. have to be careful because that's under our search and seizure mm-hmm. section eight. If you ever read our charter, I don't know if I will, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> entertain. Yeah. But then after that, after we get like the Tim Hortons cup, we would still need to after we would still need to confirm that that's the actual person. And that's mm-hmm. why she said that she would need to write the warrant and then actually get a buckle swab from that person. Yeah. So that we can make sure. And even if you are on our database and we are able mm-hmm. to identify you through yes. that, I still need to write a new warrant to get a new sample from you. Yep. Just to confirm. It's the same yeah. down here. Yeah. Okay, so that was maybe a little bit of truth in some of those those cop shows I've watched. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little bit, but we're not going to punch you in the face and have your nose bleed and then run no. that out. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the person got into a bar fight, no. But then you'd have to some. Then they'd have to throw their shirt in the garbage or something. Then you could take it, right? Well. If they got into a bar fight, then mm. we have a crime scene. So That's different. Oh. That crime scene. So it's just so we can take what's ever in the crime scene. Nice. And so you're kind of hoping just, they bleed everywhere. Yeah. Or or, or, just, <laughs> or they yeah, assault you know. someone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, then they're cooked anyways. Okay. Decent. I have so many loophole questions. I wrote down like another seven, but... Um, if you're just joining us, this is SciChat. We've got DNA criminalist Leela Periello and Detective Lisa King with us tonight. And it's just, this is just a treat. Both of you, thank you for being a guest tonight. Um, the guest that was supposed to be uh, got sick, actually super sick, probably Aww. COVID and canceled at the last second. So the um, both of you said you had come tonight, which is awesome. So thank you. Um, my, my next question Ah, uh, and, and then for the audience, we will have a Q&A section here coming up pretty quick. My next question is, what do you think is the future of criminal analysis with DNA and things like that? Do you, is there any technology coming down the pipe that you know about that you could tell us about? Or what is your, what do you think the future will be in the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, one of the things that I know that they're working on right now is called rapid DNA. And it's where it's like a little instrument that can go into the intake at the jails. And when somebody's arrested and they're booked into jail, the, the deputy or officer there would be able to, to obtain a buckle swab from the inside of that person's mouth and then stick it in the machine. And then that would actually generate a profile. Oh, wow. So they're working on stuff like that. And then it would have to be confirmed by an, an actual analyst, but um, those profiles would be compared to, um, or instantly compared to like homicide, uh, uh, violent, violent offenses. Hmm. So that's something I know that they're working on now, but the, the kits that we're working with to obtain and amplify the DNA that we have continually get more, more and more sensitive. So the touch stuff that I talked about earlier Um, we would be able to analyze more samples like that. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, we've actually worked. We had a a trainee and her trainer actually swabbed her dog after she pet her. And she was able to get the trainer's profile off of that swab. Off of petting (laughs) the dog? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, my goodness. That's cool. It was very cool. And then I saw another article where they... Um, swab the inside of police dogs' mouths after they bit people, oh my and they could, they could get a profile that way. It's really cool. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. So. Well, I think if somebody broke into our house, we'd have Bunsen would bite them probably, and mm-hmm. Beaker would want to love them. So the, we could get DNA two ways from somebody that breaks into our house: the there inside of Bunsen's <laughs> mouth on, on on Beaker because she'd be like, "Oh hi." This is, so great. We have new company. Pet me. Yeah. Come, let me show you where they keep all the good stuff. And Bunsen's like, no, you're not supposed to be here. Chomp. <laughs> bite, bite, bite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alisa, over to you. I'm not sure if you have any, any, any insight on that question. No, not on the science of it. That's more a Leela question, but mm. it's just, uh, I know even just the time and I've been into 
policing 24 years now. And it's uh, from the time I started just to the how quickly we can get in the type of DNA analysis done now mm-hmm. is just amazing. It's just mm-hmm. uh, leaps and bounds ahead. Do you find, since you've both worked to, in different areas of crime, for, I'm like, you're not doing crime, you're just solving crime. I may, I'll make that clear. Um, <laughs> I, I phrased that wrong. I was going to say the same thing, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, Dexter. Ha, oh, ooh, yes. Um, is it getting easier to catch criminals with the new, with technology? Like, is it, is, do you find it's getting easier? Or not so much. Hmm. It's the technology helps us when we identify them. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it certainly comes that way. Uh, you have your very smart criminals as well. Mm. Um, some of them are are harder when they go into the wind or or whatnot. But generally, it's um, we find them. It's just a matter of when. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, the new. Um, Another technology thing that that helps with this is the genealogy that they're starting to do a lot more of. Um, I don't know exactly how all of that works, but the the genealogists are actually able to trace back from profiles that they get on like 23andMe or Ancestry Mm -hmm. and somehow build trees that actually incorporate your suspect. It's it's amazing what they can do. So that's, that's one of the newer technologies that are coming out. My mom was big into that and she sent her uh, DNA to one of them things. So like from my mom's profile, if I became a criminal, then I could, they could probably say, oh, there's this guy's maybe a potential suspect. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yes. What? That's cool. Or if we find missing or like deceased people uh, yes. where we need to use DNA and uh, we have an idea, maybe we'll go to familial DNA at that point. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So I'm kind of at the end of my questions. I, I think we'll open up the floor to the audience. If I, well, no, I have, I have a few more questions, but I think I'll leave them in, um, in case somebody in the audience has one of them. Um, Leela, are you and Lisa okay taking questions? Absolutely. Awesome. So if you've never been to SciChat before, we I only allow people up to the stage to ask a question if I recognize your account or if you're following us. Um, if you have a protected account and I don't know who you are, you're probably not going to get up to the stage. Um, so I see somebody requesting who has a protected account. You can DM me what question you'd like, uh, but just to keep the safe the space r- safe, um, because there are trolls that kind of j- want to jump up and take over. I, I, I'm only going to let folks up that I, I, uh, I know and who follow Bunsen and Beaker. So I'm bringing up some folks right now. Okay. Paula, Liz, and then Cece. Hi, how's everybody doing? Hi, um, Lisa and, uh, Lena. It's so nice to hear from you guys. And oh my gosh, I, I'm so fascinated with all of this. It's so, isn't it so cool? (laughs) <laughs> it is so cool. <laughs> and um, and you guys are, I know Lisa is the dog mom of famous um, Benny and Bowie. And and I, I'm going to ask uh, Lila what kind of pet she has. But my first DNA question is, I have a kind of a couple of things here. But um, how do they get DNA from cases that are a long time ago and they mm, solve them? That was one of my now. questions, Paula. Good job. Yeah, because you feel that you see like, like a like a crime that was maybe 25 35 years ago and then all of a sudden they sell it and they i mean they they you know get some dna from something is it clothing or is it hair and then they and then they they nab the criminal so it's like mm-hmm. or they let them go so yeah. you know, unfortunately <laughs> you kind of wonder you kind of wonder how how that comes into play today because they didn't have that stuff 50 years ago right, right. It, it didn't, yeah. Yeah. So if they if they have preserved that item of evidence, say it's a t shirt or whatnot, and it has some blood stains on it, um, if they've preserved that that item of clothing well enough, DNA can last decades. Um, so then with the, the technology is getting more and more sensitive, um, it's able to detect the the smaller amounts of DNA that might be in one of these cold cases that we have. So then we would be able to amplify and detect that DNA a lot better than they would have back in the day. So how, how much of a sample that you would need? I mean, is, is it, can it be like minuscule to really be able to put those pieces together? 
Yes. Technically, okay. if, if we do the math, I really only need like, what is it? Um, I think it's like three and a half cells worth wow. of DNA to actually get a profile. Wow. So, That's really cool. Yeah. Okay. My second question is to um, Leela. I, I see that you played bagpipes. Yes. <laughs> and I want to know, how did you ever pick up that instrument? Do you have <laughs> Scottish in you? and Or did somebody in the family say, you know, let's learn to play the bagpipes? <laughs> that's a pretty loud instrument. I love that. It, so I think yeah. that's so wicked cool because you have to really know how to pump that bag and everything. So It's, it's a love-hate relationship with the bagpipes. So. <laughs> um, I've got some Scottish in me. Um, and then when I did my master's degree, I did it over in Scotland. So I, I was over there. But when I moved to Southern California, there was a Scottish society and I met some people through that. But one of the detectives um, at my department was on the honor guard and he played the bagpipes and he sent out an email saying, hey, does anybody want to join the honor guard and play the bagpipes? And he was he was my first teacher. So, cool. That's yeah. really cool. Okay, and then this is the pet question, of course, because I want to know everybody about everybody's pets real quick because I don't want to take up too much time. But, of course, we know um, Lisa's famous duo, but she can yes, say a little bit the about them. And the beans, yes. And then I want to know if you have any pets. Because I can hear a kitty somewhere. I don't know if it's Yes, or... that's mine. Oh, okay, because <laughs> I heard this little meow. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, so. that's Mr. Frodo. Um, cool. He's about 10 kilos. So he's a he's a big boy. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is he so a cool cat? Is he or is he just a big cat? He's just he's a big brown tiger cat. I don't know oh, cool. <laughs> what else is in him, but yeah, he's he's my boy. And uh he used to be diabetic and now he's not. And I'm so cool. excited. Oh, that's so exciting. So, Good for you. Yes. Good. We switched his food and and we were able to fortunately reverse his diabetes. So super happy. Oh nice. Yeah. Awesome. I'm a cat girl. <laughs> now Leela left out a little bit about playing the bagpipe, bagpipes. We talked oh. about this on the podcast. You mm -hmm. played the bagpipes for the cast of Outlander. Yes. Yes, I did. The, <laughs> you know, the, the, one of the biggest TV shows in on TV right now, <laughs> Outlander. And you got to meet yeah. some of the, the actors and actresses too, oh, I think. I'm so jelly. I'm so jelly yeah. right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we played at Comic-Con in San Diego uh, for the first couple of years that they were out. And I met Sam and Kat and Ron Moore and Diana and let's see who else. Um, what other guy? I forgot the, the gentleman, the older. I forgot his name. Oh, he was also in the in the Hobbit movies. I forgot his name. Graham. McTavish. Graham, Graham McTavish. Yes. yes. So we got to meet them. They're all extremely lovely people. Very nice. So. Yeah, that was a highlight <laughs> for sure. Well, there you go, Paula. Bagpipes, cats, and Outlander. Thank you very much. That that's that's a that's a trifecta right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Paula. Over to Liz and then Cece. Good evening, friends. So I have two questions. Um, one, what really frustrates you guys about DNA and all that kind of stuff when it comes to TV shows, you know, like hacking is just really fast typing type stuff. And two, um, is there a case where you just been like, yes, science, you know, like um, the innocence project, like these, these poor people who've been in jail for ever mm. and then DNA has exonerated them. Is there one that really sticks out to you guys that is just awesome? That's it. <laughs> uh, one of the things that annoys me about the TV shows is how fast they do everything. There's no way that that we can get everything done that quickly. Um, if it's a, a super like public safety case that requires us to rush something, um, we can get it done in a couple days, but not usually. It's and it's uh, management of crime scene and no notes. Nobody takes any notes. Oh. It drives me crazy. Like it's just I want to join that police force because I don't have to take any notes. <laughs> <laughs> it would be amazing. <laughs> It'd be and uh, just um, we did have one case. We had a, a serial predator out and he was escalating, so it was only a matter of time before 
uh, somebody was going to uh, be murdered. So we had one and were able to profile or get a DNA uh, sample uh, profile for us in 12 hours. So that was really impressive. Hmm. Small. And then, Leela, did you have a DNA case that exonerated somebody? Um, that that was the second part of Liz's question, or no? Uh, I can't really think of one in in my job right now. Okay. The innocence project in general is just amazing. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, I think her. And we've had a lot of, like, the Paul Rand case, is, it, which is, um, it's an old case in Canada, but it, it stems and it creates a lot of case law in the way we do things and investigate things. Uh, he was exonerated with DNA. But we, um, it, when we investigate, we investigate to exonerate or to implicate. And when we get consent DNA samples, um, if we've got serial or predators going, or a serial predator, or we've got uh, we're just trying to eliminate people if we're, we're bringing in um, possible suspects and they provide a DNA. It's a good way to eliminate them or exonerate them so that they're not accused. Because we've, yes. we've had people come in and uh, looks like a duck, swing, swims like a duck, sounds like a duck. It's got to be the duck. And then we get a DNA and we realize, no, it's not the duck. Mm-hmm. So it's um, hmm. it's amazing. Uh, or in cases of like the sexual assault if you have yeah. a consensual partner um we need to get that that reference from your consensual partner so that we can eliminate them as yeah. a potential suspect exactly so. mm-hmm. all right thanks liz so no life of crime for you right um on the straight and narrow <laughs> Well, I didn't win Powerball last night, so <laughs> neither did I. Yeah. <laughs> what was it? Two billion dollars? Yeah, After yeah, tax- two bi- Yeah, it was one point nine billion. After taxes, nine hundred twenty-nine million. Million, yeah. Well, that's about two billion Canadian. So yeah, I could live on that. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. I just want to pay off my house. Oh my goodness. That is just, that is a bananas amount of money. Um, there was a couple questions in the chat. If I'm just going to go to one before I get to CC and then we'll go to CC and then answer the other one. Karen J asked, I have a question, please. Concerning the backlog of rape kits in the U S to check old criminal trials and convictions. Are the labs catching up? Do we need more machines? What's the situation in Canada? (sighs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we do have a huge backlog. Um, speaking, I can only speak from my department right now. Um, and we've actually implemented some new technology approaches to help us um, uh, get rid of that backlog. Hmm. And I think we're doing a good job with it so far. Um, we've actually, it's, it's called Y screening. So, when we get a sexual assault kit where it's a female victim and a male suspect, we can actually do a very quick method to see if any Y DNA or male DNA is present. If so, then we can move forward with that case. Um, This helps us to go forward with the ones that have male and then to eliminate any that don't have male that we wouldn't it, it saves us time by not working the cases that don't have any male DNA present. So that's one of the ways that we're, we're trying to get our backlog down. So I'm just trying, I'm not sure if we have, I know the way we do it, with, at least in Ottawa, um, if there's a, a, a sexual assault kit that's done, um, it'll go into storage. We need consent from the victim to actually process it um so we uh get that and if they are going to be proceeding we will process it then and Mm -hmm. if they're not it'll go into storage for us we have no statute of limitations for indictable offenses here in canada Mm -hmm. so um once we've got the evidence it it will pro we'll store it properly so that we can use it uh, in the future if need be if the victim doesn't want to proceed at the time Hmm. we have slightly different laws here in the states um at least here in california um it it used to be that we could store uh assault kits um say the story changed or they didn't desire prosecution 
um, we were able to store it. But there was a new law that came into effect just a couple of years ago where we have to look at every single sex kit, no matter what, and go back to 2016. Um, so even if somebody's already been convicted and DNA wasn't used, but there's a sexual assault kit, we need to go back to that kit and examine at least one piece of evidence in that kit, um, whether they consented or not to um, uh, analysis of their kit. If a kit was collected, we will examine it. So. Yeah. yeah, and that's just, uh, we have just very recent uh, rulings in that where we now need consent mm. of the victim to process it. Yeah. And, and even to the- use it in court. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's constantly changing. Oh, that's, that's, that's one of the things thing. is to to stay on top of all of that. And then, like, especially when the law changed and then we had to go back four years worth of mm-hmm. cases, that, that increased our backlog. But Yeah, that would be huge. Hmm. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that great answer. Um, Karen, hopefully, hopefully that gave you some insight to your question. Cece, over to you. Thanks for waiting patiently. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you all so much for this fascinating talk. And Layla, I'm still trying to get my jaw off the floor about the Outlander thing. <laughs> um, this is so cool. I got a hug, I got a hug from so Sam. It's so cool. Um, but uh, anyways, I have um, two uh, questions. Um, first of which is um, a little bit... Um, technical but like how do you decide which parts of the genome to analyze like how is sort of that determined and then my second question um which is more for both of you since you both specialize in sexual assault which can be a really um heavy topic to work with on a daily basis how do you all um take care of yourselves to make sure that um, your sort of mental health is not getting impacted too much by your work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go with the, the areas that we, we analyze. Um, they're set locations or loci uh, in the genome, and they're areas that are non-coding for uh, any proteins or, or things like that. It's the non-coding region that we look at. But we're specifically interested in these these 24 locations because they have high variability. Um, so my, say my loci on one of the genomes is, or one of the chromosomes is called FO, and mine would be maybe like an 810, but Lisa's would be a 1214. Um, it's those, that variation within that one loci that gives us the, the statistics that we need to come up with those huge numbers. So you want to find um, locations that have high variability, but they're the locations that we look at are determined. Um, at least mine are determined mainly by the FBI. They'll choose the areas that they want because of CODIS or the, the, the database that we use to, to house all of our, our information. Um, we have like a core 15 loci that we examine, but we also look at another, the other loci from Europe, the ones that are commonly used over there. So we're, we don't pick and choose the, the, the locations that we look at. Um, those are scientifically chosen by higher entities than myself um, for their high degree of variability to get these big statistics. Hmm. I hope that, does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay. That's that is very cool. Thanks. And uh, just for like lifestyle maintenance and health maintenance mm-hmm. and mental health, um, I um, Lila deals with with science. I kind of deal with the people part of it, the victims mm-hmm. and the accused and all the witnesses and uh, whatnot. So it's. It's important to stay healthy. I'm a runner, so I love to run. I love to work out. That's a good thing. My dogs are huge um, with uh, helping me uh, de-stress and just uh, 
making me laugh at the end of the day. <laughs> I, it's not a huge coping mechanism, but I do enjoy wine. So I do have that. <laughs> Um, and it's just it's it, it's really important just to talk in in our sections. Um, we have to uh, we go see a psychologist uh, as well to be assessed just to make sure everything is OK, that we're uh, we're doing OK, because if we're not OK, we can't do our jobs mm-hmm. and our families suffer as well when we're not OK. And it's just it's it's just, I think, self monitoring. There was there's a time I did sex assault and child abuse for seven years and I needed a break from it. So it was um, sort of a, th- um, a little uh, course I took, and I thought, geez, uh, it, it's all in colors. It's uh, uh, just a, a program, and I thought, geez, I'm pretty close to the red. I don't think that's good. It's time for me to maybe step back for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I did that. So now it's just so that, which is how I got into the training end of things. And uh, now that's been five years, and they've asked if I can come back and investigate again. And it's something I would love to do. So I'm just waiting for my transfer to come through. But. Very cool. Mm. Yeah. The, I think your coworkers are a huge support system. I, I love my coworkers. We can talk about anything and everything. And it, it's just helpful to, to be able to have those discussions with, with people to understand what you're working on. Absolutely. And I don't know about you, Leela, but we have a really bizarre, wacko sense of humor. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, to outsiders, I think that the humor that, that Lisa and I, that we have in our units would sound very callous maybe or mm-hmm. dark, but yeah. it's not meant to be that way. It's a, it's a coping mechanism because otherwise if we don't laugh at certain things, um, it's just going to eat you. So, yeah. Mm. It, I- I've been to many a dinner party where I've said something and oh, the yeah. table just goes quiet. And <laughs> no. Yes. Look at my oh, no. And I go, did I did it? Did I do it again? And he You're like, just yeah. Goes, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so uh, whenever we go out to like eat as like a unit or something, we're like, um, can we sit like way over there or outside? Yeah. So we don't yeah. bother anyone <laughs> <laughs> with our conversations. Yeah. 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 <laughs> What a good question, Cece. Oh, thanks. And I'm really glad that both of you have such good support systems. And thank you. I am too. Thank you. Richard had a question from um, the chat and he asked, are there chemicals or what chemicals corrupt DNA? Now, hopefully he's not planning to use that to <laughs> uh, Scrub a cl- crime scene clean. So, Richard, um, anyways. Mm-hmm. We'll keep an eye on you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, bleach is a is a good one. Um, it's one of our cleaning products that we use a lot. Um, it has a tendency to, to break up the DNA. But it, we can still find DNA because a lot of people don't clean well enough. Like you have to let the bleach sit for a while and then scrub it to, to break up that DNA. Um, heat, humidity, those are, those are good to, to degrade DNA. Um, Mm. yeah. Uh, peroxidases, those are good too. Hydrogen peroxide, that works. You can go into, uh, like a crime scene, just a bathroom, for example, that's spotlessly clean and shiny, and then you put a blue light on it, and you can tell exactly where all the yeah. blood is. Because they, so, they yeah. kind of clean, but not really. Not really. So don't yeah. get any ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> especially in the cracks and crevices, people yeah. forget about those, and we'll actually go into those cracks and crevices and get the, the stuff out. So. Wow. <laughs> all right. Um, Danielle is a new speaker. Danielle, over to you for your question. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I joined a little bit late tonight, so I missed the very beginning of this. I'm so sorry. Um, It was really just more of a quick comment, though, for you guys um, to say how in awe I am of what you guys do. And thank you both for what you do. Um, Last month, actually, as part of my job, I attended a two-day forensic science symposium. Um, I'm not a forensic scientist, so it was incredibly eye-opening for me. Um, Very, very interesting. Uh, A little intense sometimes, um, but it was just so incredible um, what science is out there um, and, and how 
the smallest bits of DNA can really help solve some of these cases. Um, they had all sorts of presentations for us. One was a case that was, I think, like a 30 or 40 year old case that they were able to solve using DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just, it was very, very interesting. And so thank you both for everything that you do. And it's just, it's so incredibly fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a couple people in chat that have said the same thing. They're just so grateful the work, for the work that both of you do um, for society as well. So, yeah, and and I think the same thing. Yeah. And for my little heart emoji, there you go. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll uh, last call for questions because we're at the top of the hour, and side chat runs about an hour. Um, do any of our speakers have any further questions who are still up here? No. Okay. Um, I have, I have just one, I have a question, um, and that's for Lisa and that's about, uh, Benny and Bo- Bowie. <laughs> Go ahead. So in following Benny and Bowie, do you find their personalities are as different as Bunsen and Beaker? Yes. Yeah. I find like it is, it is crazy. Sometimes I think, do they actually read your tweets? Because they (laughs) are, uh, Benny is so mellow um, and just so easygoing. And Bowie reminds me so much of Beaker. She is just, she is, uh, just like a tornado all the time. She's <laughs> constantly uh, playing bitey face or trying to wrestle with Benson. She's stealing all his toys and he just sits and he's just like, okay, whatever. Okay. Like it's, uh, it's amazing. Their personalities are so different. That's so different. hilarious. And they're both goldens too. I was wondering because, um, you know, we, we talked on the science podcast a couple times and then with, um, Kathleen Morrill about it doesn't even matter. Like within a breed, you can have completely different personalities from dog to dog quite easily. So I was just curious about that. (laughs) Yeah. It's amazing. The difference just uh, from one to the other. And my husband keeps saying, don't worry, she'll calm down. And I just look at him and I'm going, I don't Uh know. Have you met Peter? I don't know. (laughs) And then he's getting so big. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's getting there Well, she's growing fast. Six months now. Super cute. Super, super cute. Um, okay, uh, Laura's requesting to speak. I, I can. We'll take one more question if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then we'll we'll do a little wrap up. Uh, Laura, did you have a question for our guests tonight? Um. Yes. Yes, I do. Um. Um. Thank you. Your, uh, everybody for coming by and having this um, interesting conversation. My question is to these ladies is what are your feelings when prosecutors and judges um, mostly on appeal absolutely refuse to test or um, I don't know. There are they don't uh, trust the validity of DNA evidence mm-hmm. on a person. So I mean, I've heard of judges that where the a person was exonerated basically by the DNA, but the judge is like, "Nope." The jury said you're guilty, so you're guilty regardless of the DNA. I mean, this just makes me livid. Now, has society not caught up to the science? Or the law is not caught up to the science, or or how do you feel about these kind of um, um, issues with DNA? I find it frustrating. Yeah, that, I would as well. Okay. Um, the, you know, it, it is to me, it's science. It's it's that's what it is. I, I tell you what's there or what's not there. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to tell you if they're guilty or not. That is up to the jury. That portion. Um, Mm -hmm. but I will tell you what is in that sample, Um, Mm -hmm. but it can be very frustrating when they, they don't pay attention to the science, but I think it's just an issue of not having it explained well enough, maybe. Uh Um, and then if, yeah, I think it's a matter of understanding. 
unfortunately, some people that get on the stand might not be able to explain the numbers properly or where exactly they found the sample and how they determined it was this other, this person. So mm-hmm. I, I think explanation is a, is a, an important part of it. Hmm. Oh, okay. Definitely articulation. I, I know it's just, if I were to have a case um, as, as a detective, if I were doing that and DNA exonerated the person, I wouldn't be proceeding with charges against them. And in, mm-hmm. I, I know in, uh, in, Canada, I can't speak for for the states, but uh, we can go to our crowns, which are the Canadian version of your prosecutors, and say, uh, this is what uh, new evidence has come in. Uh, It's exonerating this person. Let's withdraw these charges and the Mm -hmm. charges could be withdrawn. So we can do that at our level. We don't have to wait for a judge to do it. Well, at least Canada is more humane than the U.S., I guess. It might be more of the like the cold cases that maybe yeah. I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's and it's just it's amazing how like and it's um, we're leaps ahead too with investigations on on how we're doing things. And of course, we're never going to be a hundred percent where we're not going to be accusing an innocent person, and that's uh-huh. probably, that's very very frightening. But yeah. yes. Um, it does happen. Uh, we're not we're not perfect. But I, if I had DNA evidence that said in my investigation this person wasn't it, I would have mm-hmm. those charges withdrawn because we've got the wrong person, and the person that's committed this crime is still out there. Still out there. We need to find yeah. them. Hmm. So, yeah, it's a safety it's, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's mainly frustrating with like the people that are already convicted, like yes. twenty years ago, and then you're trying they're they're trying to exonerate them, and they're already in the system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that is that is a very frustrating thing where they like the judge or whatever jury they hang their hat more on you know eyewitness yeah. testimony or things like yeah. that. So. Yeah, which can be very inaccurate. At times. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, it's really frustrating. You got somebody that's been in jail for twenty years. They got evidence that could exonerate them, and a judge says or a prosecutor says, "Nope, not happening." I mean, that is mean it's cruel it's inhumane i just i don't understand it well in in some cases there the defense is also trying to get every single thing tested to try Mm -hmm. to throw in doubt but it doesn't actually help the case so that might be like an like an issue that might be that you might be thinking about um Mm -hmm. where the judge says no no more testing um where but the defense thinks that it'll help but yeah. in reality it might not so unfortunately there there's a lot of information that doesn't make it into the media for uh criminal cases uh-huh. and and i've found that for like with my my death investigations is that the stuff that i'm hearing on the news is way different than what the reality is of my case that i'm working hmm. yeah i don't know if that's the same for lisa Oh yeah. The media, it's just, I, I've been in trials and then I hear it reported on the news and it's just, I'm thinking, are we sitting in the same trial? <laughs> it's like telephone though. Somebody tells somebody, yeah. tell somebody and it gets changed yeah. a little bit. It's just enough mm-hmm. to mess yeah. it up by the end. Exactly. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, you know, it's, I'm glad to hear that at least at your end, you're trying to fight for what's right. Oh, yeah. Um, because um, it's just, it just makes, it, it's one of those things that makes me absolutely livid. Well, it's a good a good point you brought up, Laura, and thank you for your question tonight. And thank you for being a speaker. Well, and thank you for um, this, this chat. Oh, I'm, I, I'm just hosting it. I've got two geniuses over here that are doing all the explaining, so. <laughs> well, you were the genius. I don't know. Okay, so I think we'll do a, a little wrap-up here. Um if you aren't following Benny and Bowie, that's Lisa King, Detective Lisa King. So make sure you give Benny and Bowie or Benson and Bowie, a.k.a. The Beans, <laughs> a follow. And then also follow Leela Periello, a DNA criminologist. Um, anything exciting on tap coming up for the winter here, uh, you two? You got anything coming up in the next couple months? No. No? Okay. I got it. Sadly, yeah. Got a trip in so, February. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've got one in March. Yeah. Like a vacation or something? Yeah. Yes. Oh, nice. Well, I hope I hope I hope that comes and it's super exciting. 
Hope so. <laughs> best wishes to Lisa. <laughs> yep, best to wishes you. to you as well. Maybe it, maybe a Benny Bo- uh, Benny and Beaker date would be lovely for Christmas. <gasps> oh yes, yes. Or as I say, as I add the pressure there for poor Jason because yes. we've got nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I'm I've been asked to come speak at uh, the Tells World of Science, and then they also asked Marla, who's Kuno's uh, mistress. So uh, we're going to try and meet up. It's those evenings are so busy. So um, and the the science centers are so big. We're going to try and meet up maybe before and have the dogs do a little meet up and get to know each other. So we'll see how that goes. Um, But but Kuno is also a service dog. So that's something we have Mm. to be really cognizant of. Oh, it's the Roddy. Yeah. Kuno, the service Roddy. Like Kuno's a work. He's got a job to do. Right. He's Marla's service dog. So it's not like we can you know, <laughs> take Kuno for a bunch of photos. Uh, he's, he's working. So um, the timing just has to be right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So as we wrap up tonight, thank you both of you for being our guests tonight. Lisa King, detective, Leela Periello, DNA criminologist. Um, thank you for me to you. Uh, normally Chris chimes in and she's has some good insight, but she is at parent teacher interviews. Um, so thank you. And to our speakers who came up to ask questions, thank you so much. And to everybody who listened tonight, uh, very short notice. You're probably wondering what's going on with SciChat. I was scrambling. Um, But again, thank you to Leela and Lisa for coming through in a pinch. This Saturday, we have Pet Chat. Uh, I think it's just going to be a normal Pet Chat. I'm still trying to reschedule with Gideon. Gideon.